Hey guys, in this video we're going to be talking about the French Ruby Pistol, this three pound chunky monkey made in Spain and 32 caliber that the French had to emergency order for World War I. Now at the time of World War I, the main sidearm of the French was the MLE 1892. Uh, this oddly beautiful revolver uh, was in not quite mass production um, up until World War I, um, but the French pretty much in 1915 they halted production of the, uh, of the 1892 so that saint can focus just on rifles and machine guns. They're just caught off guard, kind of everybody scrambling on every side. You know, I mean, even the Germans were scrambling with their airsats program. Um, so pretty much the French are looking around. They, they need sidearms. They look to their southern neighbor, of course, in Spain, who has a pretty well-established firearms industry at the time. Uh, and they look to specifically this company, uh, Gabriel Londo, E. Oresti, probably mispronounced that. Um, but they had just pretty recently started making um, knockoff Colt 1903s. Spain at the time, that, that was just sort of their thing, is kind of making knockoff pistols at the time. I think it had something to do with their copyright law. So France now is looking at them. Uh, Gabri Londo has this, you know, pretty tried and true by this time Colt 1903 system. Um, it's a straight blowback pistol. It's a pretty straightforward gun. Uh, so the, the French are looking to this thing. Of course, it's chambered in 32, which isn't uncommon at the time for, for some nations to field. Um, so France orders this. They actually order initially uh, 10,000 pistols a month. They up that to 30,000 pistols a month. So Gabrielando is having trouble meeting this 30,000 pistol a month re you know, request from the French. So they kind of turn to cooperate with other gun makers around sort of subcontracting this out. Uh, and these other gun makers, there's just a whole plethora of them. There's, there's quite a bit. Um, probably the most notable, though, is the original contractee, the uh, Gabri Londos, as well as um, Astra. So you can find, you know, Astra-made Ruby pistols, as well as a bunch of other manufacturers that you've never heard of before. So it's pretty neat. There's quite the plethora of them out there. At some time during all this, some of these Spanish uh, gun making companies just kind of bypassed the whole subcontracting thing and just sort of contact France directly for orders. So there's some other contracts outside of that as well, directly from the French for, you know, from pistols from these other firms. Uh, it's, and, it, and it's kind of a mess, especially with the, with the Spanish Civil War. We don't really know exactly how many were made and, and by whom. So um, there's not a whole lot of hard data out there on these pistols, so a lot of this is kind of guesswork done by, you know, collectors and historians. Right now, I think the best guess for how many total number of ruby pistols that were produced for the French for World War I, I think is around 970,000, something like that. So, so a whole bunch. Of course, not all of those survived the war. I think after the war, uh, the French inventory, they had like 500,000 um, handguns of all types in inventory. So um, you can just imagine how many hundreds of thousands of these were actually lost during the conflict. So after World War I, the French pretty much know how bad their arms situation is. You know, they know their revolver is outdated. You know, they know these, you know, 32 chambered rubies. It's kind of lacking and, you know, for, for firepower for a handgun. So of course they go through with their, you know, 1935 pistol system. This is an ASP, they had the 1935 um, trials for, you know, they adopted the A and then later on the S. And here comes World War II now, and what gets pressed into French service again, uh, an emergency for World War II? It's the Ruby. The, the Ruby pistols were actually fielded um, by the French during the war, you know, obviously pretty briefly. So, um, so the Ruby pistols kind of did go up against the Germans one more time. Um, and then kind of after the, uh, the, the French and German armistice, uh, Rubies went to the, uh, the Vichy forces and they also ended up in the hands of French resistance. Um, so these did actually, these were used throughout the war, um, which is kind of neat. You know, it was probably never intended to, to you know, be used that long, but uh, the pistol was actually used through both world wars. Now, crazy enough, the Ruby <laughs> not only did it serve through World War II as well, uh, but this pistol served uh, through uh, the Indochina campaign and into um, Algeria which is pretty nuts. Um, I think there was one officer, I think he was in Indochina, he, he said he took a tally and he found 16 different manufacturers of the Ruby pistols that were in Indochina at the time. So, so quite a bit of these Ruby pistols were still being used after World War II. 
uh, which is which is just it's it's I guess that's just a French thing. You know, they they just had a uh, whole lot of them. You know, their situation's not ideal, so they had to press them into service even well past World War II. From what I read, the French nickname for the Ruby pistol was uh, the Gabby, uh, which kind of makes sense with uh, Gabby Landos. So you know, just Gabby short for Gab Gabby Landos. Um, it's kind of neat. I kind of like that a little bit more than uh, Ruby, the Ruby pistol, but I think just everybody knows that as a Ruby. If you call it the Gabby, probably not some people are going to know what that means. Now let's get in and do some close-ups and I'll show you the variations between these three pistols because uh, the variations are quite extensive. So just as a size comparison, um, here's the three Rubies on the left, the uh, MLE 1892 and a 1935S here, uh, just to show how big the ruby was. Um, I mean, even just, you know, compared to like a Colt 1903, uh, these things are pretty big. Just just overall, they're a little bit more uh, bulky and, and, and chunky because the steel, they, they because of the type of steel used in these, they kind of had to use thicker steel than the, than the original Colt 1903. So, I mean, you can see that, um, I mean, it's pretty comparable, shorter slide, but overall the size is pretty comparable to 1935S. Um, which is, of course, has a you know, much more powerful cartridge in it. Um, so just to kind of give you that size reference, the, you know, the, the rubies weren't small. Now, one of the first things I noticed about the rubies when I bought these three was the, uh, the slide serrations that are on these. They're pretty different. You know, they, they range from these you know, straight serrations to these sort of uh, curved serrations on the other two rubies here. Um, they just seem to be all a, a little bit different, like the, I guess I don't know if they specified, you know, with the with the curved serrations versus straight. I don't know why some people did one or the other. I'm guessing it was a cost factor um, as well, you know, just in the manufacturing of the pistol. So that's just something neat to point out that kind of all of these will have just, you know, slightly different serrations. Another thing you might have noticed are the lanyard rings here. Um, now these are all slightly different styles. Uh, you can see this one and this guy are just a little bit different with the post that the ring goes through. Uh, where it's just sort of a, a loop. There's no kind of ring hanging off of the, the Astra model there. Um, so it's just kind of one of the neat variations that you'll find, you know, just between rubies. There's just so many variations. The safeties are also pretty different on all of these. Uh, they all work the same pretty much. Uh, forward is safe and, uh, you know, rearward or down is, is fire. Uh, now the French, they did not, you know, carry these with one in the chamber, um, you know, in their holster. So pretty much they would, you know, they'd have this sort of, uh, what would you call it, condition three, where you have a loaded mag and an empty chamber. They, you know, produce the pistol and they would rack the pistol. You might have been wondering, why does this Ruby pistol have acne? Why does it have a big pimple on the slide? Who did that? Well, uh, this is an actual French thing. Uh, the French added this dimple to the slide uh, in order to sort of protect the safety on the gun. So uh, whenever the pistol is stored in a leather holster, uh, and the pistol is drawn, the, the leather rubbing up against the side of the pistol uh, might flick this safety to the on position, um, which if you carry this as the French did without one in the chamber, if you drew the pistol and the, uh, the safety got flicked on uh, and then you racked it, um, that safety is there gonna hold the slide open, uh, which now you might be in a dangerous situation or combat or something and wondering why your slide is locked back um, so they added that dimple just in order to keep that uh, safety from flicking on. Um, that's the only slide hold open on this pistol. Um, there's no last round, you know, hold open feature on this. So it's not well known if this is something that was done uh, during the war or after the war. It might have been done after the war in the 20s. Uh, but this um, single or double digit uh, code was added to the, uh, the frames and the magazines of these guns because the parts, including magazines, are not interchangeable between the different manufacturers. Meaning if you had, you know, say a uh, Gabrielando made, Gabrielando made Ruby, and you try to put that magazine into this pistol here, um, it will not work, or, or at least it won't work reliably. Um, so it was important that, uh, that these guns were marked. So you will find markings here on the left side of the pistol as well as down on the magazine. So these usually um, stand for the maker. So this is uh, Gabi Gabilados E. Oresti. So it's, um, you know, GU. 
This one for the maker, it's just uh, GN. I'm not gonna try to pronounce that again because I'm just gonna mispronounce it. Uh, and then the Astra pistol, um, for whatever reason, it got a, uh, an EU. Um, and you can see uh, the magazines are marked down here. Some of these magazines, they, they appear to be uh, nickel plated. Um, so this is the correct um, Astra pistol for, or Astra magazine for this pistol. Um, where others, like this one, or some, they were some type of blue, they had some type of bluing finish on them. So that one's, you know, GN um, for this pistol type. So you would just want to make sure when you get, find these that these have the correct magazines in them to have the best chance of them being reliable. So if you're checking out a Ruby, one of the things you'll want to do is uh, look at the bottom of the pistols here and see if there are any stars on the bottom. Um, these stars denote that this, these are actually French uh, service pistols. Um, not all of them got stars though, because uh, we know this pistol here, because of the big zit on the side of it, we know this was an actual uh, French military gun. And, uh, and the, the stars are a little less pronounced on it. Maybe there's something there, but um, I would say there's probably not stars on this guy, even though we know this is French because of the, uh, because of the pimple. So um, I would just say, take it with a grain of salt, but it is a good sign if you do see these uh, little maker codes on it and stars on the bottom. And while we're down here, let's check out these magazine releases too, because they are all very different. Um, I mean, the, the, the shape and size of these are, are very different. Um, some of these, when you, when you use them, uh, they just seem to, uh, to, to work a little bit better than others. Um, it's just, again, this is just another, you know, neat variations between the manufacturers. Now these Ruby magazines, um, they're pretty generic looking. I mean, these, these look a lot like uh, maybe FN 1922 magazines or something like that uh, because, you know, because of the length, the nine round capacity. Um, but obviously these do not have um, any sort of indentations up here at the top for any sort of like push button magazine release. Um, so if you, if you find any magazines like this, uh, you might want to look at the bottom and see if there's a maker mark on it. Um, the one that came with my uh, Gabi Londo here, uh, there's, there's no markings on it at all. So it'll just be a crapshoot if this gun is reliable or not. Um, you can see it's with this particular magazine, it's a little finicky just trying to load it. Um, with the others, not, not so much. Um, you can see this is a pretty neat uh, nickel plated mag is kind of nice just some were not not all were um, it seems like maybe Astro kind of did that a little bit more than other manufacturers and here's a decent close-up just showing the uh, the different you know maker markings on all the different slides again there's so many variations with these different makers um, I mean these to me just are just begging to be collected there's just they're really neat guns uh, and I find this kind of stuff really cool on mill serps now the Ruby pistol is not super appreciated on the US collector's market because um, these things sell for pretty cheap, you know, regardless of its World War I and World War II history. I mean, like you can get a run of the mill Ruby for probably four to five, something like that. Um, they're pretty inexpensive pistols. You can find them much cheaper as well. So, I mean, and with a wide variety of different makers and even just different, you know, variations between each maker throughout the war, um, these are you know, pretty collectible pistols, you know, some, I could see somebody just having, you know, trying to collect every single manufacturer of Ruby pistol out there. And uh, I mean, that'd be, that'd be a pretty unique collection too. Now the gun, you know, it, it's just under three pounds. It's pretty heavy. Uh, you know, like if you hand somebody this, probably the first thing they're going to say is like, wow, that's, that's, it's heavier than it looks. It, it is, it's a pretty heavy pistol, which as far as shooting 32 out of this, uh, it really helps to tame the recoil. Um, this, you know, this doesn't, re you know, kick that much whenever you shoot it. Um, it has a nine round magazine, which is, you know, kind of why the, uh, the, the pistol grip on the gun is so long. The, uh, the sights aren't bad at all, really, for, for what this gun is. Uh, you know, it's like a 32, or that's just, you know, kind of a personal self-defense pistol. Um, the, the sights are pretty much adequate. Uh, one of the weird things about this pistol, though, is just how uh, wide these grips are. Uh, it, it feels feels surprisingly good in the hand, the, the Ruby does, and then also the, you know, the unique later on that's based off the Ruby. Now, all of this extra grip space, um, it seems kind of wasted, you know, with only a single stack magazine, but, you know, at the time, you know, that was mostly the technology out there. 
just single stack magazines. So I would suggest if you come across a ruby in the, out in the wild or on Gunbroker or something, um, consider getting it if the, if the price is decent and you know the gun's in decent shape um, because they're, they're pretty neat. I think these fill uh, kind of a niche in any sort of maybe pistol collection or World War I collection, something like that. Um, and they're not too expensive, so you know, might as well, if you have a pistol with a lot of history that's not too expensive, just go ahead and check that box and pick one up. Um, I definitely recommend it. Um, you know, depending on the maker, though, you might have feeding issues. I would just say if you're buying a Ruby, just go ahead and plan on having some reliability issues or maybe some magazine issues. Um, you know, obviously make sure that the, uh, the magazine matches the pistol. That's one way to kind of ensure better reliability. Um, but just respect it for what it is. Um, which is pretty neat. I don't do a whole lot of videos on Milsert pistols, but if you want to see more, let me know. I'm not sure what you guys' ratio of pistol to rifle is, so just comment and let me know if you prefer pistol videos or you prefer rifle videos, just so I can get a good idea of the demographic of like what you guys want. Um, if you want to see pistols, the next thing I was thinking about doing is the, uh, the 29M, a uh, video going over the 29M, because I don't think there's one of those on YouTube right now, of uh, just going over the history of it. So that'll be probably next on the docket. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Like always, I, I appreciate all you guys that, that comment everything. And uh, Ahmed, I swear one day I will make a German bayonet video just for you. But uh, thanks so much for watching, guys, and I'll see you next time.